Lots of things going on in the world. I heard that um, um, with the uh, Supreme Court decisions that are probably going to come out and make a lot of people unhappy that um, this is going to be called the summer of rage. And, um, whatever. It's already started. It's a good rage. No. At at Joel Osteen's church um, over the this past Sunday, they had some people that are upset over the Supreme Court decision, mm -hmm. and these ladies took off their dresses in church. I, I see that. <laughs> I saw they that on TV. Oh, they, <laughs> <laughs> they showed it on TV. They wow. Yeah, they did. They recorded oh, okay. it. They had it on TV. Had a Spading, Spading's to right. That was at Joel Osteen's oh, church. Oh, yeah. So, the world's getting crazier by the day. I've been saying that for since I've been in this pulpit, so uh, it just happens to be coming faster at us than, than the norm. Anyways, this evening I want to talk about um, why Jericho why Jericho fell. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. We'll get into this message and, uh, and uh, see what God has for each of us. Gracious Father, we thank you again mm -hmm. for the ability and the opportunity to gather, mm -hmm. to hear your word, to expound on the princip biblical principles that you put forth. Thank you. Help us even now, Lord, with wisdom and with understanding. Bless us, Lord, with... Uh, with a download from heaven for each of us. We thank you, Lord, that we have a place to come, a, a dry place, a comfortable place. We thank you for your faithfulness for the last 30 years. And Lord, we just pray that you'll give us another 30 years. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm not sure if I'll be the one standing here, but I hope so. <laughs> but in any event... Um, we're going to look at Hebrews 11.30 this evening, and my topic is, Why Jericho Fell. And so Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell, after the people had marched around them for seven days. Those two little words, by faith. How many people could, by faith, make walls fall down? You'll find out in a minute what a great miracle it really was, but we'll save that for a minute. But there's few Bible stories that are well, more well-known than the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. We know it so well that when someone starts to tell the story, you probably already started subconsciously singing that famous African-American spiritual Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. And then there's this verse. You may talk about your men of Gideon. You may brag about your men of Saul. There's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. I guess the, the singular nature of this particular event makes it stand out um, pretty well. Because the story is a story of God's people emerging victorious when facing impossible situations. Oftentimes, most people face impossible situations and they just fold, or they just say, forget it, or they just walk away, or they do something stupid, or they just um, try to deal with it in other ways and just make it worse, turning to drugs or sex or alcohol or whatever. People drowned out their problems in a lot of ways, and then they find out afterwards their problems are worse than what they started with. Ouch. No, I'm not looking at you. Don't call me tomorrow, okay? <laughs> but, um, you know, although God promised to give them the promised land, it was a promise of God. He promised them the promised land. The mighty walled city stood in their way. And oftentimes, God says, I'm going to give you this, or this is yours, or you'll have possession of that, or I want you, you know, to, to, to move forward. But then there's that obstacle that's in the way that makes it impossible. So we say, God couldn't have been right about saying that. There's no way because, I mean, the obstacle's just too big. But unless they found a way to bring down those walls, the city could not be taken. I mean, it's just a fact. And if the city was not taken, then the promised land that was beyond the city wouldn't be theirs either. But God promised them. 
So, I mean, how does this even all figure into, the, into play? You know, we only need to know one important fact. It was totally impossible to bring those walls down. Humanly impossible. Totally, absolutely, completely, utterly impossible. See, Jericho stood between them and all that God had promised to them. And that's how God sometimes works. I mean, you know, a smart man would probably look at those walls and say, no way, and just walk away. Sometimes you got to, in the wisdom of Kenny Rogers and his theology, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. But yet God's people won a great victory that particular day because they understood the promises of God. But you might say, well, that's true, but it doesn't work that way for me. How did it happen? I mean, Hebrews 11.30 answers with two words, by faith. It happened by faith, and that's all it says, one sentence. And the first two words are the key words to the whole sentence, by faith. But the story seems so incredible that we probably need to investigate this a little further. What sort of faith was it? that caused the walls to come down. Have you ever thought about what kind of particular faith? I mean, you could just look at a big wall and say, average faith isn't going to make those walls come down, or a little bit of faith isn't going to make those walls come down, or my little measure of faith. The Bible says all of us have a measure of faith. So from a biblical standpoint, we know we have a measure of faith, but my little faith is like the size of a, size of a mustard seed. So... My baby faith isn't going to make this happen. So what sort of faith is it that caused the walls to come down? And so I think I've come up with a few answers to that particular question. And so in the first place, the walls came down because, number one, faith in spite of long odds. If you ever visited the Holy Land, Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Not many people have, I suspect, in this group. You no doubt visit the remains of that ancient city of Jericho. It's right there. I mean, you can't miss it. If you're in the Holy Land, one of the tourist attractions is Jericho, this promised land and this city that was the, the place that prevented everybody from getting to the promised land. But to get there, you either travel down the mountains from Jerusalem or you could take the river road coming south from the Sea of Galilee that runs parallel to the Jordan River. The city itself is not located far from the river. And an important point to keep in mind when you read this story is of Joshua's amazing conquest. You see, Moses is dead. Uh, God sends Joshua to take the people into the promised land. Moses isn't going to make it to the promised land. And the Canaanites, they built Jericho, this walled, fortified city, as a new kind of gateway fortress. I mean, all right, $50. You know, I wonder if excuses are going to work in heaven. I doubt it. But, you know, Lord, I thought I was in. What do you mean I can't get in? Well, you better... You better be sure. But anyways, the Canaanites built Jericho as this gateway fortress to the land, to the promised land. And any invading enemy or any invading army would have to deal with this great walled city of Jericho. It was intentionally built this way. It was supposed to be this way. You could not simply bypass this fortified wall in this fortified city. Jericho was too large and too strong to be ignored. So, what was Jericho to Joshua and the people of God? Have you ever thought about that question? I mean, literally, what was Jericho to Joshua? Why was it so important, and why was it so important to the people of God? First of all, uh, Jericho was a, a pagan city. It was a pagan city of absolute unbelief. Secondly, it was, a, it was a strategic, important city. And thirdly, it was a city of human impossibility. Nobody could, nobody could, could uh, penetrate those walls. And all three of these points are critical. 
See, pagan unbelief must be confronted head on. See, a lot of times we think, well, I could play with my little idol. It's not that big of a deal. But that's not how it works. See, the corrupt Canaanite religion with its emphasis on idolatry and immorality could never coexist with the true worship of God. I laugh when I see those coexist bumper stickers. It's like, these people, we need to have a church service right here in the middle of the road because they are confused. So, idolatry and immorality, they don't coexist with the true worship and the one <laughs> true God. It just, they don't mix. It's like the, about the lady that I told you that I met at Meyer when she seen my Jesus t-shirt. Oh, I love Jesus. Is he your God? No, he's not my God. Good man, prophet. No. You know, and, you know, a lot of people just have different views of who Jesus is. And, um... Some of the views are not so good. Amen. But when you think about the idolatry and immorality of Jericho, they knew, Joshua knew as the leader, and the people of God knew that it had to be confronted and it had to be defeated. <laughs> See, for them to occupy the land, they couldn't just coexist with all of this craziness. First of all, it had to be confronted. Secondly, it had to be defeated. And thus, the city had a spiritual importance, but it also had a military importance. And because the walls were so high that they seemed to reach the sky. Imagine walls like that. I mean, we're not talking about average walls. We're not talking about little six-feet fences or neighborly fences. In, in Deuteronomy 9, verse 1, it says that these walls seemed so high, it seemed like they reached the sky itself. That's pretty tall. The city must be completely defeated, or the Jews would never be safe. So here's the problem. In the last about 150 years, archaeologists have done an enormous amount of research on the ruins of ancient Jericho. We now know that the city of Jericho saw actually... Um, not one set of walls, it had two sets of walls. It had the inner wall and it had the outer wall. And they were both built on a slope intentionally, making it virtually impregnable to any attacking army. So not only were the walls so tall they reached practically to the sky, going up to the walls was a steep slope which even made it more difficult. And because Jericho was one of the oldest cities in the world at that time, it was built and destroyed and rebuilt many times over many centuries. And once the city was destroyed, those remains were left simply to be rebuilt on top of the old city. So there were new cities built on top of the remains of existing cities, kind of. And with this constant construction, destruction, reconstruction, eventually it created a kind of hill of ruins that they call a tell, T-E-L-L. -L. And as researchers dug through the various layers, they discovered that Jericho had indeed had a heavily fortified and been completely destroyed by fire in approximately 1400 BC. Archaeologist Brian Wood describes the famous walls of Jericho this way. The mound or the tell of Jericho was surrounded by a great earthen rampart or embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base. The retaining wall was some 12 to 15 feet tall. On top of that was a mud brick wall that was six feet thick and about 20 to 26 feet tall. At the crest of the embankment was a similar mud brick wall whose base was approximately 46 feet above the ground inside the retaining the first retaining wall this was what loomed above to the israelites this 46 foot tall retaining wall and so it loomed above high above the israelites as they marched around the city each day for seven days humbly speaking he goes on to say it's impossible for the israelites to penetrate this impenetrable bastion of jericho even by our standards, a wall that's 46 feet tall is pretty tall. And then 
Wood, the archaeologist, goes on to mention that there were probably several thousand people inside the city when Joshua arrived on the scene. He also notes that the city was well prepared for any siege, with spring inside the city walls and harvest having just been taken, according to Joshua chapter 315. So they had plenty of water and plenty of food. They had a water spring inside the walls, and they also had just finished harvest, so there was plenty of food. Jericho would have had enough food and plentiful water for multiple years or several years. So how could the Jews, in the face of something that was so seemingly impossible, think that they were going to penetrate these walls and penetrate the city? A frontal attack simply wouldn't succeed. You're dealing with a 46-foot tall wall, and then it's a double wall. And they had no way to tear down the walls or enter the city. They didn't have equipment to do that. They didn't have John Deere bulldozers and <laughs> earth-moving equipment at the time. It was all done by hand. And if they could not skip Jericho, then if they could not breach the walls themselves, then what could they do? They couldn't enter even the rest of the Promised Land because that uh, prevented them from entering the Promised Land, this fortified city of Jericho. But the Jews faced an even greater obstacle. The walls fell because faith that followed a very strange plan. And you might say, well, what the heck does that mean? See, if you read Joshua chapter 6, God instructed the Jews to do a number of unusual things, none of which had any military value. In verse 3 of Joshua 6, he says, March around the town once a day for six days. That's certainly going to bring a 46-foot wall down. Then, in verse 4, he says, march around with the Ark of the Covenant. Then in verse 4, it says, put seven priests out in front of the Ark and march with them. Then in verse 5, it says, on the seventh day, march around Jericho seven times. Also in verse 5, it says, have the priests blow ram's horns as they march. And then also in verse 5, it says, on the seventh time around, on the seventh day, have the people shout. Then in verse 5, it also says, when the people shout, the walls will come down. Then in verse 5, it says, when the walls come down, enter the city and conquer it. And then Joshua added a few refining details to God's plan. First of all, gosh, Joshua said, I instruct my people to be perfectly silent as they march around the city. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Secondly, he says, I'll put soldiers in front of the priests and behind the ark. And thirdly, he said he'll have the priests blow the ram's horn, the shofar, not just once or twice, but continually. So for six days, they marched around the city once, and then they returned to their camp. And on the seventh day, at the end of the seventh time around the city, the priests sounded the long blast, and the people shouted as loud as they could. And let's stop the story right here. What are the chances that this particular strategy would cause the mighty walls of Jericho to come tumbling down? Think about this. Marching, blowing horns, and shouting. Walls that are six feet deep or wide and 46 feet tall. We're going we're gonna to march, we're going to blow horns, and we're going to shout. Sounds like something you'd see at a football game. A lot of noise, a lot of nonsense, maybe some marching, that's the band, but nothing really happens. I care, especially if you're a Lions fan, <laughs> but that's besides the point. We won't go there, that's a whole other sermon. <laughs> nothing happens. But I guarantee you that you won't find one military expert anywhere who would recommend the Joshua plan for for taking over a city. Because when you have to conquer a walled city, this is no small point. And shouting and marching and blowing horns doesn't seem like it's really going to work. But let's lay out the simple equation. Marching plus horns plus shouting equals, who knows, 
Probably not much of anything. What you got so far? Marching, horn, shouting. Probably just a lot of noise. Suppose you go to the Great Wall of China. I don't know if you know anything about the Great Wall of China, but it snakes its way through the northern um, side of China for hundreds and hundreds of miles. What would bring down a wall like that? Well, you could come up with many things, but marching and blowing horns and shouting probably wouldn't be on your list if you wanted to demo a wall like that. So far, what we've got would seem to fail in the category of the History Channel's greatest military blunders of all time. See, you've probably seen the History Channel special, Greatest Military Blunders, but this probably would be their top episode. You know, how to conquer a town by shouting and blowing horns and marching. But at this point, we encounter something new and vital. The wall fell because faith that God would somehow give them victory. <clears throat> See, faith added to it would give them victory. And we have two hints in the story that make this possible. See, first, God said he was going to give them the city. When God says he's going to give you something, you might have to exert a lot of effort to get it. But God, when he says it's yours... It really is yours. And this is what God said to Joshua before he gave him the plan. See, it's important to know that this is what God said to Joshua before. He didn't know what the plan was, but in Joshua chapter 6, verse 2, God says, See, I delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. So even before there was a plan on what we're going to do, God promised them that he was going to deliver Jericho into Joshua's hands. Note the past tense. I have delivered. He didn't say, I will deliver. He said, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. See, God speaks of Jericho as having already been defeated. When he just gave the idea to Joshua. And that's a key point. God is saying, this is a done deal. Those walls are coming down. It's just a matter of time. Nobody likes to wait, but hey, that's what he told Joshua. Now, that shouldn't surprise anyone who believes in God. See, God can do things like that, and God speaks, and it gets done. Not according to our time, according to his time. In a real sense, though, the battle was over before it even got started. God promised to deliver the city to Joshua, and in due course, he made good on that particular promise. The second point is this. God put himself in the middle of the battle plan. See, when God said that he was going to give the city of Jericho to Joshua, God put himself in the battle. You might miss this on casual reading of this particular text, but God put himself in the middle of the battle by having the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant as they marched around Jericho. This is found in verse 4 of chapter 6. Remember, the Ark contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Ark contained the golden pot of manna. The Ark contained Aaron's rod that budded. And the lid of the Ark was the golden mercy seat where the high priest would offer a sacrifice in the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. How do we know that? It's referenced in Leviticus chapter 16. But the ark was just not another piece of religious furniture. There's lots of religious furniture in churches. It wasn't like a table or a chair or a lampstand. The ark represented the very presence of God, the presence of God with his people. And putting the ark out front was like God saying, I'm going to lead this parade. And he did. See, all normal military options are now off the table. It's the people plus God. So if you prefer, God plus the people, spears and armor don't seem to matter at a time like this. Yet there's another point to consider. What exactly were the people of Jericho thinking 
during that long week when the Jews marched around their city once a day. In total silence, except for the sounds of those blaring ram's horns. The Bible tells us that they shut the gates for the fear of the people. That's in Joshua 6, verse 1. This happened before the marching even began. I think to cultivate the effect would have created a sense of mounting dread within the city. They knew that the Jews could never breach the walls on their own. But on the other hand, they were trapped inside and dared not to go out. Plus, they had heard how the Jews had just crossed the Red Sea as if it were dry land. And now they had heard that the Jews had defeated the two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og. That's in Joshua 2, verses 8 through 10. Plus, they had a strange marching to contend with each particular day. These people are marching around our property. It's like somebody that walks in front of your house. What are they doing there? You know, this is the third time today. Why do they keep marching in front of my house? Why do they keep walking by my house? But one image that is kind of divine in psychological warfare is at work here. Although the people of Jericho did not know it, they were defeated before the walls ever fell. See, they lost the battle when God got involved. And let's redo that equation that I just gave you one more time. Marching plus horns plus shouting, now plus God, and the walls came tumbling down. See, when you add God, it changes everything. The equation now with God makes the walls tumble down. See, if God it was the one who made all the difference at Jericho, those high walls were no match for the Almighty. I mean, let's think about this. The God who created those stones could easily blow them over. See, the armies may not have been able to knock them over, even if they were six feet in diameter and 46 feet tall. But God could. See, we don't know exactly how God did it. But we know for a fact that he did it. And the city was then taken by Joshua and the people. There was a day when Robert Morrison was a passenger on a ship going to China. History records that Robert Morrison was the first Protestant missionary um, to go to China ever. And one day the captain of the ship asked in a rather disparaging question, what do you think you're going to do when you go over there? You're going you're to try to convert all of China? And he said, no. He said, I don't think I'll ever convert China, but I think God will. Amen. See, it all depends who's on your team. See, Robert Morrison didn't have the mistaken belief that he was going to convert all of China, but he believed that God could and God will. And that's the same faith that brought down the walls of Jericho. So we come to another characteristic, the fourth characteristic that we could call Jericho faith. The walls fell because faith that expressed itself in preserving obedience. See, a lot of times we think that, you know, uh, we say this little whisper, this little prayer, and it just should happen. But, but hear this. If God's the real hero of this story, and of course God is, we face another question. Why did God have the people march around the city for six days and then seven times on the seventh day? If God was just going to do this, why did the people have to be involved at all? It's not that their marching somehow destabilized the stones in the wall. It is, I think, a lesson about the power of God on one hand and the need for perseverance on the other hand. See, a lot of times we just expect God to do something but while we're waiting and while we're depending on God, we have to persevere. We have to hold on. Because a lot of times the winds are blowing and the storm is there. We say, God, where are you and what are you doing? Mm -hmm. God wants us actively involved in doing our part. Mm -hmm. You see, most people think faith is passive faith. But it's not passive faith that God honors. God honors active faith. Living faith. Faith that has shoe leather. Faith that actually does something. A lot of times people are like, I have faith, I pray. Do you? But do you have active faith, living faith? 
See, if you read the rest of Joshua chapter 6, you'll discover that God promises do not equal inactivity. See, a lot of times we think, I'll just sit on my, on my couch or I'll just lay in my bed and pray. If I lay here long enough inactivity, in my inactivity, God's just going to do everything for me. You know, God's going to pay my bills. God's going to cut the grass. I mean, God's going to even wash the dishes if I lay here long enough. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, God's promises never equal our inactivity. See, read this whole chapter and you'll discover what God expected. In verses 6 and 7, it, it required diligent preparation on behalf of Joshua and the people of God. In verse 10, it says it involved careful discipline on behalf of Joshua and the people of God. In verse 14, it says it required patient rep repetition on behalf of Joshua and the people of God. And then in verse 20, it says it required audacious exaltation on behalf of Joshua and the people of God. And then in verse 21, it says that it required complete obedience for Joshua and the people of God. And then in verse 23 through 25, it says that it, the people of, of God and Joshua had to have intentional compassion. Think about this for a minute. God could have, could have said, sit tight, I'll do everything. Your bills will be paid, the dishes will be washed, your lawn will be cut, your children will be fed, their diapers will be changed. Really? Where do you sign up for that? See, I'll knock over the walls and destroy the city myself. You don't have to do a thing. So, is there any problem with that? No, not really. See, God is fully able to work with or without <coughs> human means. See, a lot of times we think, well, God just... God just should do it. God can work with or without human means. But God's normal plan is to use people to accomplish his purposes. Let me repeat that. The normal plan of God is to use people, committed, faithful people, to accomplish his purposes. So even though God caused the walls to fall down, the people still had to march. They still had to shout. And when... The, the walls fell down. They had to do something else. They still had to take the city. See, even after the walls fell down, the city was occupied by the enemy. So after the walls came down, they were fighting door to door to take the city itself. God gave them the city, but they had to fight for it. A lot of times we think, you know, if God was really God, he should just hand me things on a silver platter. Wait, make it a gold platter because silver is not good enough for God. It should just be easy breezy, easy peasy for me. Why do I have to do anything? That's not how it works, folks. And this is precisely the point of the writer of Hebrews who wants you to understand it all happened by faith. The walls fell with those two little words, by faith. How do we know it was by faith? Because the people of God put their faith into practice by marching around the city day after day after day. And then, when they precisely followed God in obedience, then the walls fell down. And so we can sum up this lesson, this whole story, with one final statement. The walls fell because faith acted in spite of any doubts. See, most people, we don't do anything. When there's doubts... Oh, whoa, 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 I was driving down Van Dyke and there's a red light way up there. I think I should just pull over now. You know, that's how most people are. You know, I should just apply the brakes now because I can see the next three lights are red. And so I don't think we should go because those lights are going to stop me anyways. You know, most people don't act because they have too many doubts. God's not really going to do this. Do you believe in those fairy tales? Come on. Be real. Let me give you the best definition of faith I've ever heard. Faith is belief plus unbelief acting on the belief part. Did you guys hear that? Sorry, next phone. I think I'm going to start collecting cell phones. You know, like they do in school. 
Put all your phones in this basket, and af after school's over, I'll give them back to you because you guys aren't adult enough to turn them off or you don't know how they work, so we might as well just collect them all and put them up on the shelf until after lesson's over. Lord Jesus, help us. But faith is, the, faith is belief plus unbelief and acting on the belief part. We all know that belief is involved in faith. See, you have to believe something before you can have faith. You have to have the substance. You have to believe something before any faith is there. See, if you go to a doctor, you probably believe he can help you. If you don't believe, you'd never go to the doctor in the first place. Right. See, before you step into an elevator, you've got to believe that that elevator is going to hold you up. Especially a guy my size. I mean, you wouldn't step into an elevator if you thought, gee, I hope these cables are strong enough. I'm a big one. No. See, if you don't believe, you'll take the steps. You won't get in the elevator. So before you get in an elevator, you have to believe that the elevator is going to hold you. So belief is always the first, first part of faith. It's the conviction that certain things are true. Unfortunately, some people stop their definition of faith right here. They think faith is belief plus nothing else. See, if I only have that little bit of belief, then I'm good. See, to them, faith is pure belief without any mixture of any doubt at all. That's okay as long as you stay in your house, as long as you stay in your bed, and as long as you stay under the covers. But in this world, it's hard to arrive at 100% certainty with anything. See, you hope your doctor can help you, but you might get better, you might get worse. You hope the elevator will hold you up, but maybe the other guy before you was bigger than you and maybe the cable's gone bad. You don't know. Same thing with an airplane. You know, you hope the pilot knows what he's doing. Thrust, lift, and that big bird, mm -hmm. tons of weight, takes off off the ground, even with a guy my size in it. But people who truly believe that faith means 100% certain certainty, mm -hmm. you know what they are? They're paralyzed. Oh, yeah. They're waiting for something to happen that will never happen. In truth, there's always unbelief mixed in with our belief. You see it best in the big decisions of life. You get a job offer. <clears throat> it requires you to move. Eh, I'm not sure about that. Don't know if I want to do that. But it's a great opportunity. But you really don't want to move. You're stuck in your present job. Your kids are happy at their present school. I don't want to move. Your wife doesn't want to move. But you found a house that's twice the amount of house for half the money. You think you should. But some of your friends aren't sure about it. So they talk you out of it. And late at night, you lie awake, tossing and turning, first going one way, then going the other way. Should I? Shouldn't I? That's reality. See, you don't have 100% certainty with anything, and you don't know any way to get to 100% certainty. So you think and you think, you hope so, you pray for guidance, you seek counsel, you write it all down, you wait for that lightning bolt from heaven, but that lightning bolt never comes. You think it didn't take faith to march around Jericho for six days and then seven times on the seventh day? See, God told them that the walls would fall down, but they still had to do the marching. That's acting on the belief part. But what really is faith? I have a new definition that I've never shared with you before from this pulpit. See, in the decisions of life, Faith is not waiting till you have 100% certainty. Faith is wavering between belief and unbelief, doubt and assurance, hope and despair, and finally, hesitantly, with your heart in your hands, acting on the belief, acting on the belief part. Let me put it this way. Most people think living by faith means staying over in the belief column until you get to the certainty column. But that almost never happens. That's not living by faith. Actually, the way most people live is stalling by faith. 
Think about it. Well, I'll think about it. Well, someday. Their whole life is stalling by faith. They don't do anything great because they're stalled by faith. They don't act by faith. They don't live by faith. That's my new word, stalled by faith. See, living by faith means acting on the belief part. It means taking a step in faith, taking a step of faith. However small, however halting, however unsure you are of the certainty part. And in light of that, we can understand the story more clearly, the story of Joshua and Jericho. See, the Hebrews marched around the walls once a day for seven days. Can you imagine the scene? Thousands of Jews lined up the first day to march around the city in front of the priests with the Ark of the Covenant. They marched around blowing ram's horns and inside the city, the pagans were scared to death. Nothing happens. So the next day the Jews march around the city again. Then nothing happens. The third day they march around again. Nothing happens. Only this time the people inside, they're starting to think those fools out there. You know, let's drink a little bit of Hennessy. Let's drink a little bit of bourbon. Let's drink some of that vodka. We can relax a little bit. After three days, this is just baloney anyways. Nothing's happening. They're goofy coop balls out there marching, marching around our city. This is some kind of crazy joke. Let's have a drink. Let's smoke some weed. Let's enjoy ourselves. See, they must have thought, these dang Jews are nuts. Walking around our city blowing horns and they think they're going to take us over. And outside, some of the same people were complaining. Hey, Joshua. What's going on, man? This is a waste of time. Let's attack them and get this over with. Let's figure out how to scale that 46-foot wall. Walking around this wall is not going to do anything. This is dumb. This is stupid. This is pointless. So there was probably grumbling on both sides. Probably a little bit more on the Jewish side, but hey, who knows? On the fourth day, they march again. Nothing happens. This time... Some garbage flies over the wall. The people of Jericho are now shouting insults at the people of God. On the fifth day, same thing. The sixth day, same thing again. And on the seventh day. On the seventh trip around the city that day, the horns start to blow. The people let out a great shout. And in one miraculous moment, the walls came tumbling down. That's it. See, that's how faith works. Don't you think there were some doubters on both sides? Don't you think there were some critics on both sides? Don't you think there was some grousing in the ranks? We have to do this again. Are you serious? But God told us to. But this is stupid. This doesn't make any sense. Complaining seems to be part of human nature. Grumble, complain, grumble some more. Some people wake up grumbling. Imagine that. Feel sorry for the person that sleeps next to that one. <laughs> but these are all real people who are trampling around in the hot sand day after day. They probably had some justifiable, justifiable reason to complain. It's hot. This is the desert. It's nasty. It's extremely frustrating. Nothing's happening. This seems so dumb. But they did it. See, because of Joshua, they were acting on the belief part. And then they took that step of faith. God honored it, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down to the ground. You know, it's kind of funny. A friend of mine told me about J. Hudson Taylor. He was a dynamic faith missionary whose efforts helped open China to the gospel. Time and time again, he saw God do amazing things in the face of absolute hopeless circumstances. Reflecting on his experience, he once remarked that there's three stages in most great tasks that have to be undertaken for God. The first part is impossible. The second part is difficult. And the third part is done. See, sometimes that's the way it starts. It just seems impossible. Here's one thing you learn whenever you start to do something for God. It won't be as easy 
as you think. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of times we think, you know, it's funny. I swear, two or three times a week, I get calls or I talk to people. You know, I want to start a ministry. Matter of fact, I just talked to a guy yesterday. You know, you seem to, ministry seems so easy for you guys. I'd like to start a ministry in your church. How much would you rent your building out for a few hours every day when you're not there? Huh? You said you wanted to start your own ministry. Why would you want to come over here? He says, well, I don't want anything to do with your ministry. I can learn from you guys, see what you're doing. You can give me some things to get started. <laughs> what do you really want to do? You know, and he says, well, I'll rent the building from you. You can just help me. You can show me what to do because I've never done this before. I said, well, you can come here for a while and see what we do. It's no secret. I said, ministry is hard work. Well, I just want to get some people together and they'll do the work. Okay. It doesn't work like that. See, the fact that you're doing something for the Lord, um, you know, for a lot of people seems to make no difference at all. It's going to take some effort. It's not hard to see why we think this way or in, in, in off ways. After all, you know, when we work for the Lord, actually, your motives should be lifted to a higher plane. Actually, if you search the scriptures, you'll see godly counsel in the scriptures. We pray for guidance and we believe that God is pleased with our efforts. And still, things just move slowly. Things never move fast enough. Just ask my wife, Sue. Things never move fast enough. <laughs> so what we thought would take weeks takes months. And sometimes what we thought would take months turns into years. And sometimes if you're not focused on God, when it takes longer than you thought, enthusiasm lags. Sometimes when it takes longer than we thought, we get stuck in the mud. The curious become skeptical and critical. And doubts take dead aim at our faith. Because doubts always try to wipe out your faith. So, why should it be this way? Why should it be so? Could the Lord just have set it up a different way? The answer that he could, and sometimes he does, but often God allows us to struggle and sweat so that we learn to trust him at a deeper level than ever before. See, God wants to take you to a higher level but first he has to know that he can trust you at that level. So to trust you at that level, you have to sweat and you have to struggle. My little friend that wanted to just come over here and rent the building for a few hours and use what we have to get started, there's no struggle or sweat in that. He just wanted to come and, but he said, but I'm already ordained. Ordained by who? And, um, but God sent me here. By God or by yourself? I mean, who knows? Yeah. See, most of us spend most of our days looking at the wall of impossibility. See, we stare at those walls of Jericho and think, it's never going to happen for me. See, the bad news is that is really impossible when you just look at impossible. So then that impossible becomes your impossible. The good news is that God loves to start with impossibility. See, if God made it easy, then it wouldn't take any effort. It wouldn't take any struggle. See, when God wants to do something big, he usually starts with something very small. When he wants to do something miraculous, God starts with something impossible. And that's what happened with the walls of Jericho. After all, when God sent his son into the world, he didn't send him to New York. He didn't even send him to Chicago or San Francisco. He didn't send them to the Pope in Rome because the Pope wasn't there yet. He sent his son to a little village called Bethlehem. See, God loves to start small because then he can show his power in a great and mighty way. He also is the only one who gets credit because most of us don't want credit for small beginnings. See, most people, they want to start at a larger level. This gentleman that I talked to yesterday, he doesn't have a ministry, he hasn't started a ministry, he's never been in ministry. 
But he wants to start with an existing ministry. But he doesn't want to work with the ministry that exists. He wants to have his own ministry and work off of somebody else's previous work. Kind of weird. I told him we're probably not a good fit. And then he looked at me like, huh? Didn't really understand what I was saying. But, you know, most people would rather start big and then go from there. But you don't start big and go from there. This little humble church started 30 years ago. It'll be 31 years in September. It didn't start great or grand. This church actually started in a living room. Then it moved to a school. And then we acquired this building. It didn't start here. It started over there in a living room. Just a couple people who wanted to serve God. But not so with our Heavenly Father. God starts with the impossible. And then he turns the impossible into reality. Just like he did for Joshua and the people of Israel. That brings me to my final point tonight. The real battle of Jericho was not with the Canaanites. The real battle was in the hearts of the people of God. And that's where the real battle always is. You see, would they believe what God had said? Would they risk public humiliation if the walls didn't come down? Would they do what seemed absurd from a human point of view in order to see God do the impossible? I love the little chorus that goes like this. Faith, mighty faith. The promises sees and looks to God alone. Laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. See, at the end of the sermon, I think I have to remind you that right now we're living in difficult days. We're living in very difficult times. You know, America has kind of been turned upside down right before our eyes. I mean, we're dealing with all kinds of craziness. I mean, just about a year and a half ago, two years ago, gas was $2. I filled up one of our vehicles yes, yesterday, last night. And, um, you know, with your plastic card, it only lets you go to $100. So I have to use it twice because it's a 35-gallon tank. Wow. And so what used to cost about... 80 bucks now cost 170 bucks wow. just for a tank of gas one tank of gas and we do that every couple days you know people say well food's free well it might be free to you it's not free it takes labor it takes gas it takes vehicles it takes manpower it takes time energy effort so people just don't have a clue you know what really happens but we live in this crazy world a lot of things. We just had a um, conversation with gleaners yesterday, and they showed us even the cost of commodities and their food you have to pay for through Gleaners Food Bank. And um, a lot of the food, chicken and potatoes, they're up anywhere from 30 to 45 to 50 percent <clears throat> just this year. Huh. I mean, food, you know. And um, it's funny because, you know, they. Um, they're trying to um, they're, they're trying to shrink all the packaging and make it sound the same thing. You know, Gatorade's no longer offered in 32 ounce bottles. It's now a 28 ounce bottle. You know, the standard Gatorade. And so, you know, cut it by 10%, raise the price a little bit, and people won't worry about it or won't even think much. You know, that's been happening with Frito chips and and Frito Lay potato chips and Frito corn chips. I mean. The bag used to be this big, now the bag's this big, half filled with air. And um, it used to be a 16 ounce bag, now it's an 11 ounce bag, and it says it's still a family sized bag. Well, maybe your family's smaller or something, but I know there's not as many chips in that bag as there used to be. But, um, you know, that's a whole other problem. But, you know, there's so many things in this world that are shaky around us. This world seems to be falling apart faster than it's coming together. You know, some people, <clears throat> you know, are still without jobs. There's all kinds of places that need jobs and can't find anybody. You know, I mean, it's kind of crazy. And, um, you know, just in the last year or so, you know, 
I went through a period of losing more friends and family than I ever have in my entire life. Maybe that's just because I'm getting old too. I'm not sure, but you know, people are dying in droves. I hope they all end up in the right place. And um, even people, unexpected people, are dying. You know, my friend Dwayne, um, we had just gone to a retreat. He was fine. He was healthy. Everything was great. And, um, you know, just a week and a half later, he's in the hospital. And just a couple days after that, he's dead. My mom, um, she was fine. Both of my parents were mentally, um, you know, sharp. My dad's 88. My mom was 85, you know. And um, she was going to come to our wedding. Everything was fine. A couple days after that, she fell in her bathroom, hit her head, and she passed away. I mean, you know, Jan, our, our church secretary, who started from day one at our church, um, you know, she was here right at the very beginning. She she had more tenure than me, you know, so she was the real union boss of Harvest Time. Or she used to say she was the warden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in a loving way, <laughs> in Jan's way. But, um, you know, she went to celebrate her um, uh, big wedding anniversary on Mackinac Island, thinking it was going to be a celebration. You know, they took her off the island by ambulance, transported her to Michigan City, um, Michigan, and then air flighted her to Petoskey, and then brought her down to Detroit by ambulance. And within a couple of days, you know, Jan passed away. So a lot of people near and dear to us, I mean, they were here and then they were gone. I mean, not only are we in an economic crisis and a world crisis, you know, we remain frail children of dust, as the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Feeble and frail, you know, and I'm glad that the Almighty remembers that we are but dust. It says that in Psalm 103, mm -hmm. verse 14, we're just dust. Mm -hmm. We're like the grass of the field, here today, gone tomorrow. But our text tells us that it was by faith that the mighty walls of Jericho fell to the ground. How do we face and conquer our own walls of impossibility? See, if I don't answer that question, I guess I've just left you hanging tonight. See, where do you find faith? Where do you find the faith to deal with the circumstances and the situations in our own life that seem to be walls of impossibility? See, if we move on to Hebrews 12, we find the answer, and the answer is very clear. In Hebrews 12, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith. See, it's Jesus but it's not just knowing of Jesus. It's not just having mental assent of Jesus. It's not just knowing about Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. See, he's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. He starts it and he finishes it. He's the captain of our salvation. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And do you know the Old Testament name for Jesus? Joshua. Joshua, the same guy we're talking about that conquered the promised land, conquered Jericho, and then conquered the promised land. See, God gave him the promised land, but God had to deal with them because the promised land was occupied. So here it's yours, but you got to fight those other guys and get them out. You might say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And the name Joshua actually literally means God saves in Hebrew. In Greek, it was shortened to Jesus or Savior. In the Old Testament, Joshua points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who leads his own people to continuous victory. That's the point that I want to make tonight. See, the Old Testament, Joshua, points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will always lead his people to victory. <laughs> Keep your eyes on Jesus. Look to Jesus. Follow Jesus wherever he leads you. See, when Jesus leads the way, the walls must come tumbling down. And this is the word of the Lord.
Let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for this word, and I thank you for this lesson. I thank you that we know by faith, Lord, regardless of what it takes, regardless of the time, regardless of the obstacles, regardless of the impossibilities, Lord, when we add faith to our belief, then things happen. We can't just have belief, we have to have faith. By faith, those two little words, by faith. By faith. And if we want, we can look into the whole list of heroes in Hebrews. It lists them one by one by one, every single one of them. They were successful in this world and for all eternity because of faith. By faith. By faith, Moses. By faith, this one. By faith, that one. It's a whole big list. Read it for yourself. Be encouraged. Father, I pray that these saints tonight would be encouraged, that you would bless them, that they would write this on the tablets of their hearts, that it would penetrate their minds, that they would be blessed because they heard the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.